Welcome back to week three of our study in the book of Colossians. Last week we saw Paul beginning his Thanksgiving section explaining how he's been praying for the Colossian believers. Tonight in verses 9 through 14, we're going to see more of exactly what he's been praying for them. So go ahead and go grab your Bibles, open it up to Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14, and we'll begin. Colossians 1, verses 9 through 14 says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. God, the words that we've just read, that's our prayer as well. And so we pray that you would do these things in us and help us to grow in understanding, in real understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul is returning here to his prayer for the Colossians. Last week, if you, if you watched the last week's video, we saw him begin to mention that he has been praying for them, but then he kind of distracted himself by talking about the gospel. And so he went off on this rabbit trail talking about the work of the gospel in their lives. It's given them a future hope that spills over into present love, present faith in Christ. And the gospel is bearing fruit and increasing in the whole world and also in them. And so now he's coming back to talking about his prayers for them. And so he's kind of looping it back up to what we've already heard Before And what we're going to see here is something that I would encourage you to just pray for yourself as well as to pray for one another. You know, one great way to to pray for one another is to use the prayers of the Bible as kind of a launching pad for your own prayers. And so let's take a look at what he's saying here. He says here in verse 9, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. So from the day that Epaphras told Paul and Timothy about the work of God in Colossae, they have been praying for these believers. Now, when you see, we have not ceased to pray for you, you you might be kind of overwhelmed. If you're like me, you're probably already overwhelmed. You might think, well, I can never do that. I can hardly pray for 10 minutes, right? How am I supposed to pray without ceasing? We're commanded in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 to pray without ceasing. Of course, this doesn't mean that all Paul is doing all the time constantly without stopping is praying in his closet with the doors shut on his knees. We know that that's not true. He's out there planting churches and and, and stirring up all kinds of trouble. But it's his constant faithfulness to bring one another to the Lord in prayer. So another way maybe that we could say this is that he has not neglected them in prayer. He's been constant. He's been faithful. And so we shouldn't be overwhelmed by this. I think that we should be encouraged by it, though, to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And just a very easy, simple, practical way to do this is to grab your church directory, whatever it is that you have that lists out the members of your church, and just pray a short sentence or two for just a few people each day. Work your way through that directory. Pray for one another. And if you're not sure exactly what to pray for one another, let's take a look here at what Paul prays for these believers in Colossae. Verses 9 and 10 here, we we see two parts of his prayer for them. He's praying for gospel understanding that results in gospel living. Gospel understanding that results in gospel living. So he prays asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's that's gospel understanding, but why? Right? Why why pray that they may understand so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord? 
fully pleasing to him. The Colossians, we, we, we saw last week, they have heard the gospel. They've not only heard it, but they've received it. They've understood the grace of God and truth. So now he's praying that the fruit of that understanding is that they will live out the implications of the gospel in their lives. The gospel isn't just intellectual. It's very, it's practical. If you understand it, but you don't live it, well, guess what? You don't really understand it. And what we're going to see throughout Colossians is that this, this theme of maturity, this theme of growing in Christ, of growing in maturity, of advancing, is so important to the letter. And Paul is concerned with the maturity of the Colossian believers. They've been threatened with a false teaching that tells them that spirit, spiritual maturity means going beyond the truth of the gospel to something bigger, something better, something more spiritual. Paul is correcting that by telling them Christian maturity isn't found by going beyond the gospel, but by going down deeper into it. And so he prays here in verse 9 that they may be filled with all the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Now we're going to circle this word filled here. You may be filled because this is going to come up again. Uh, Paul repeats this same language later on in, in verse 19, uh, chapter 1, verse 19, where he says that in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And then again in, in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, where he says, In him, meaning in Christ, all the, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him. And so we're going to see this theme of fullness more clearly as we continue on throughout the letter. But for now, just, just make note, a mental note, that Paul's prayer for them is that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will. I, I think that it's likely that these false teachers are promoting some sort of fullness that goes beyond, again, it goes beyond what God has said, beyond what God has done, beyond what God has revealed in the gospel. And so Paul is correcting that here, saying, no, no, fullness comes from God himself. Real fullness, genuine fullness is found in Christ. Real quick, who, who's doing the filling here? Well, it's God. All right, God, God the Father, he, he's praying to God that they may be filled. And how are they being filled? How are they being filled? Uh, he, he's praying that they might be filled with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This isn't human wisdom that he's asking for. It's spiritual wisdom. This is wisdom according to the Spirit. And some translations make this a bit more clear by translating this through, they may be filled through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So we got God the Father, we have God the Holy Spirit, and, and what's the end result here is that they might walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see Paul, he's given us this, this Trinitarian source and purpose here for their growth and understanding. Paul is hammering this truth home here, that true spiritual maturity, true spiritual understanding, true fullness comes from God, comes through God, and is ultimately for God. For from Him and, and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. And so we have these two parts of his prayer here. Gospel understanding and gospel living. True gospel understanding that results in true gospel living. Well, what does gospel living look like? What does gospel living look like? Well, first, it looks like walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. It's typical of, of Scripture to talk about your way of life as, as walking or, or maybe going down a path. Walking worthy of the Lord, that means living an entire life devoted to pleasing Him. This, this is a lifetime commitment that plays itself out in day-to-day in -day life, hour-to-hour -hour decisions, second-to-second -second commitments to follow Him. If we claim to understand the gospel, or if we claim to follow Jesus, if we claim to be a Christian, 
the result of that in our lives, that it should be that we walk in the way of the Lord. Now, Christians are not sinless. We're not, we're not perfect. We should be the first to, to admit that. But we genuinely follow Christ, the trajectory of our life. The path that we're walking down is one of obedience to him. And so we seek in his strength to live lives that are fully pleasing to him. True gospel understanding will be seen in true gospel living. Second means bearing fruit and increasing. Now, we saw this last time, didn't we? He says, as we walk, we are bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So what should you expect when you're filled with knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding? You should expect to increase in knowledge. You should expect to increase in the knowledge of God. There's no stopping point. The the expectation is that we are constantly growing in maturity, constantly growing in devotion, constantly growing in awe of the Lord. And so what should we expect as we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord? We should expect that we should continue to bear fruit in every good work. Now, we saw last week that these two words, bearing fruit and increasing, right? You might remember this, being being fruitful and multiplying. Last week in verse 6, Paul said, In the whole world, the gospel is bearing fruit and increasing as it does also among you. Well, now we see what that looks like. The gospel is bearing fruit and increasing in those who believe. Well, how do we know that we've truly understood? As the gospel bears fruit and increases, we also bear fruit and increase. This is the evidence of true understanding in our lives. We're seeing progress in maturity. We're seeing the work of the gospel in us as we increase in the knowledge of God, as we bear fruit in every good work. Third, gospel living looks like being strengthened with all power. Being strengthened with all power according to our strength? No, according to His glorious might. You know, the fact is, we cannot do what He's commanded us to do here. We, we cannot walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. That's, that's impossible. We can't do it. We can't bear fruit. We can't increase in the genuine knowledge of God unless He Himself provides the strength. Now, you and I, we are, are powerless. But the good news of the gospel is that God readily provides what we need. And so we don't have it in us to live lives pleasing to God. On our very best days, we're, we're powerless to please Him. And the Christian life, this might be news to some of you, it's hard. It's hard. We need strength to endure for all endurance. We need strength to be, to be patient with one another. It, it, Paul says that we can endure all things with joy. How? Only if we're strengthened with His power according to His glorious might. That same power that He used when He rose Christ Jesus from the grave, that's at work in us who believe in Him. Jesus says, Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. How often do we try to labor in our own strength? For me, the answer is way too often. The Christian life is impossible apart from His strength. And so the invitation here is to come to Him and receive everything you need. Don't don't go beyond it. Just go deeper into it. He is the source of everything you need. And finally, last thing here, what, what does gospel living look like? It is thankful. It is thankful. Living in light of the gospel looks like gratitude. Paul says we do all of this, bearing fruit, increasing, walking in a way pleasing to the Lord. We do all of this in a mode of thankfulness, giving thanks to the Father. So gospel living, when we truly grasp that it didn't begin with us, it doesn't come from our own strength, that it's not ultimately to our own credit, the results of that in our heart is that it's going to overflow with thankfulness, giving thanks to the Father. Well, what is the gospel? 
Paul closes out this section by reminding us again of the truth of the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of the work of God in Jesus Christ. It's the, it's the, the good news of God's work, what he has accomplished, not us, what he has accomplished in Christ. In Christ, God has, has qualified us. He has delivered us. He has transferred us. He has redeemed us. He has forgiven us every sin in Christ. Here's what we have to grasp if we want to grow in maturity. If we want to, want to grow in maturity as Christians, this is what we have to grasp. This is what Paul is, is, is nailing down here for us. Is that God himself has provided everything sinners need to be made right with him to grow in Him, to, to bear fruit in Him for His glory. We were not qualified for our future inheritance, the inheritance of the saints in light that he's talking about here. We, we're not qualified for that. Life forever with God, the inheritance of Christ Himself as our joy and delight, but He qualified us. We were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked, but, but He delivered us from the domain of darkness. And He didn't just stop there. He, he transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. You know, we've been given access to the King of Kings. We've been placed under His loving reign and care. We've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. In Him, we have redemption. We've been redeemed by His blood who died in our place on the cross, rose from the grave to purchase new life for all who come to Him in faith. And we've had our sins forgiven. We've received the forgiveness of our sins in Him. In Him, we've been forgiven by a holy and just and good God. You know, we couldn't begin to accomplish any of this in our own strength. And our growth in Him... Our, our maturity in Christ, it comes not as we go beyond these truths, but as we plunge deeper into the truth of what God has accomplished in Christ. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be back. We're going to see more of who Christ is in verses 15 and 20. I hope you come back and I hope to see you then. Thank you.